live in the middle of everywhere in northern if you're if you're france and you're invading almost anybody else you're marching your army through germany or if you're poland you're, or if you're coming down from sweden or any number of places your army's going to march through germany yes this is salsa city with, with his palace without care where he would go to get away from the kingly business and sort of have some fun. which he architected he designed yes, it himself he designed his own architecture that, that is his uh, his gravestone um and uh yes and, and that's me uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, where was I? I was in something with that. Potato! Oh, yes, the potato. Yeah, the reason they introduced the potato, uh, because these armies have to march, even if they're not fighting you, if they're just marching through your country to get to where they're going, to have the actual war, remember, you know, we haven't invented things like canned food yet, preservation or whatever. The army, in order to get, get its food as it marches along, has to basically take from whatever's around, which means any local farmers, you know, your crops and, and your, your farm animals, you know, they go into the bellies of our army, which leaves your farmers, you're probably going to be pretty hard up, possibly starving. These potatoes, they may not be particularly delicious, but the important thing is they grow under the ground. Which means a marching army marching through won't even know they're there, or if they do, they're not going to stop long enough to get out shovels and dig up these goofy little spuds, because they probably don't know what to do with them anyway. And once the army marches through and the potatoes are left, my peasants will have food. And the potato is actually fairly nutritious. You can get by, a human being can survive fairly well just on potatoes. There's a little bit deficient in vitamin A. So potatoes have, and milk is a balanced Potatoes diet. and goat's milk or, or, or some other greens, and you can survive. Really. That's why the Irish population exploded so much, was they imported the potato and said, we don't have to raise these bloody sheep all over the place, we can just plant potatoes in the scrap of soil. Uh, yeah, so potatoes come from Peru, by the way. No one in Europe had potatoes until Columbus and, and his the people came after that. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of reasons about why, why Frederick is, 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 is greatly honored. He you know, built Prussia into, into a significant nation and you know, gave his, his population this very significant new food stuff. Here's two of my favorite reasons why Frederick is the great. Okay, that's not the two reasons I was thinking. Bit of bad timing. Who here has seen Legend of Galactic Heroes? Okay. When Reinhardt takes over, when the Golden Blum Dynasty falls, and, and Reinhard von Longram takes over, one of the first things he does is he brings in those reformer guys and declares freedom of the press. Remember? Okay. When Frederick the Great became king, his first two decrees were freedom of the press and freedom of conscience, which we call freedom of religion. And before him, everybody in Europe thought everyone in your country has to be the same religion. It'll keep your country together. Uh, and freedom of the press means we'll let the newspapers write whatever they want about me or anyone else. And one of his friends said, uh, isn't that dangerous? Won't your enemies manipulate the newspapers against you? And Frederick's response translated into modern colloquial English is, <laughs> just you watch and see who's good at manipulating the press. <laughs> But actually, uh, what you said a moment ago uh, plays directly into, into the point I'm going to make because uh, you said you introduced freedom of the, of the press and freedom of conscience. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the things that most intrigues me about Hitalia is some of the fan reaction. And the next uh, few things here are uh, some uh, one or two particular artists I've come across on DeviantArt. Uh, this, this one was the first one I happened to see. The title of this picture is called August 17th, which is the date of Frederick's death. And of course, they, they, both in the manga, they have several instances where Prussia is talking about Alta Fritz. And this particular artist on a whole series of fan arts of you know Prussia with you know a very much more bishy uh, Frederick the Great. But again, looking at the comments of this, just like that first video I found, seeing the comments on this, or you know a lot of uh, people writing, you know, yes, I looked up stuff on him, and he used freedom of conscience, freedom of religion. He was a pretty cool guy. You know, again, anything that or fan art, this show is getting people to do some independent research and, and read up on one of my personal favorite Lightman monarchs. I think is pretty awesome. And if you can get some yowie out of it, well, fine. <laughs> So yeah, here we have uh, you know, Bishy Frederick teaching Prussia how to play the flute, and uh, this refers this uh, refers to as I mentioned, you know, young Frederick. His father was an absolute tyrant. So here's you know uh, Prussia confronting, you know, comforting little Frederick, who's probably just been beaten up by dad. Well, uh, keep on that one. Keep on that one. Whenever Frederick Wilhelm was angry, which was often, uh, he'd pull out a riding crop, a horse whip, and start whipping whoever was closest to him. Usually his son. And you'll see in this picture that the little Murph has got some scars on the right side of his face. And Prussia itself is a bit beat up. And Prussia's there like, there, there, kid, it's okay. <laughs> 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 
can't mean that. He said, well, you can be Frederick the Awesome. I said, no, I'll just stick with Alter Fritz. And it's almost the same pose from that uh, that monument I showed you. Right? Okay, a little, little cutesy squish. Okay, this one I had to do it in three separate panels because you can't read it otherwise. So it was, yeah, Prussia's being a little bit weirded out because Bishy Frederick is, is kissing his hand. And, and the final scene is, is the punchline. Uh, you probably can't read the, uh, the, the caption there. It says, uh, Ich bin der erste Diener meiner Status. I'm the first servant of my state. Which was, an, I believe, an actual code of what Frederick's view of his role as a monarch is. Not that everybody should kiss my butt, but that I, as monarch, my purpose is to serve my people. And so, metaphorically, here he is, you know, helping, you know, kissing Prussia's hand. Which, when I saw that, I just thought that was just absolutely gorgeous. And you can make it if you will. Okay, now, uh, again, to, to get off the Prussian for one back to, and back to Japan. Uh, when I first saw this, this next scene in Italia, I just laughed my butt off because I knew that this, this gentleman here would enjoy it. こんな狭いところで生まれて大変そうあるね。私中国から分からないことがあったら何でも聞くよ。お名前なんと言われるか。こんにちは。昨日落ちるところの中国さん。私は日いずるところの日本です。失礼なやつ。That actually happens. When when in in very early classical Japanese history, when the Japanese sent their very first embassy to China, the ambassadors greeted the Chinese emperor with, you know, uh, we are the representatives of the emperor of the land of the rising sun, and we're here to greet the emperor of the, of the land of the setting sun. After the guards chopped off the heads of all the ambassadors, tickled them and sent them back to the land of the monkey people, which is what the letter said, the Japanese, um, in their future relations with China, were a little more respectful. Okay, speaking of Japan, here is uh, Daniel Lewis. Sebastian. Sebastian. So, Nihon Koyemaski. Yeah. Saiko Dusio. Saiko Dusio. Saiko Dusio. Saiko Dusio. Saiko Dusio. Okay, now this is one where the fan suffers get it wrong. A lot of people get this wrong. It's actually not Pompeii's pillar. It's Pompey's pillar. P-O-M-P-E-Y. Now, admittedly, if you don't know the cultural context here, this is something to do with Italy, and it sounds like Pompeii. Okay, I, I know Pompeii was this Italian city got buried by a volcano. That's probably what it is. But no, you, you wouldn't make a, a glorious pillar dedicated to the soul of the warriors from this town that got buried by a volcano. Uh, no, it's referring to Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great, who was a, a very great uh, Roman general and statesman, a uh, rival of Julius Caesar. Talk with him all? Yeah, uh, there were three guys that ran the Roman Republic at its end days, and one was Crassus, who was so rich that we get the term crass, rich from Crassus. There was Pompey the Great, and there was Julius Caesar. And the three of them, as the triumvirate, pretty much ran Rome until they started fighting each other. Crassus went off and invaded Persia, the Persians caught him, and since he was so stinking wealthy rich, they melted some gold and poured it into his ear. Uh, and then uh, Pompey, having lost a couple of battles against Caesar, ran to Egypt, where the uh, pharaoh of Egypt, uh, Ptolemy the uh, Eighth, I think, uh, uh, killed him. And when Caesar showed up, it's like, here, here's a present. Uh, which is why Caesar decided to support Pompey, uh, sort um, Cleopatra, uh, Cleopatra, the younger sister. And then we get that big romance, Liz Taylor, whole routine. <laughs> And the pillars were made, actually, the pillar that went to Japan wasn't Pompey's pillar. It was a pillar made hundreds of years later in Rome that was misidentified as a, as a, a, by an archaeologist. Oh, the same. 
this is the thing I, I have to admit, I'm not completely clear on the complete history of, of Pompey's Pillar because I, 